they are the people who would never have left Europe. <laughs> you know, like I, right. nah, I'm not going to the colonies. I'm not going to the new That's world. Right. I'm not leaving the East coast. You know, whatever is out there past the Appalachian mountains is too big and too scary. I mean, there, there are, or yes. they were too comfortable actually, because a lot of the people who made those migrations were poor. That's right. And needed had no an alternative, viable alternative. Yeah. They were. You know, um, well that's so. true. And, and women who, um, are dependent on a male's, uh, financial assets to keep afloat. Um, some of them, nevertheless, have to push that envelope when they get to a personal place where it's just intolerable. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that all these external markers determine what their internal relationship to feminism will be, but it's a lot harder to break away from the traditional yeah. uh, hierarchy, if you will, when you cannot economically um, see yourself staying afloat very well at least in the near term, if you do yeah. that. Um, it's, I've gone through almost 40 years of learning about the Equal Rights Amendment, writing about it, talking about it, debating about it, and I come down to what sounds very, uh, like a very, I'll say mushy again conclusion, because it doesn't have a lot of hard <laughs> facts to it, but it has the truth to it, and it's what you just said. When we're talking about the Equal Rights Amendment, pro and con, we're talking about dueling worldviews. We're talking about people who read equality of rights shall not be denied or abridged and say what's to argue. That's one worldview. Mm -hmm. That's what we Don't we say. already have that? That's right. Don't we already have? <laughs> yes, I know. And we're talking about people who hear equality of rights shall not be denied or abridged maybe helped a little bit by all of the false arguments used against it. It will mean gay marriage, well, again, that's another whole issue that's end run, all this debate around the ERA is mm -hmm. less, you know, with, with my yeah. blessings. No ERA over. and yet gay marriage. That's right. But also, um, you know, uh, abortion on demand, which is another, we know that's a third rail issue, but that has been so misused, in particular against the Equal Rights Amendment, but used as just such a scary kind of thing about so many issues to keep people away from them. But <gasps> must mean you're for abortion and killing babies. The distrust that you must, I mean, it's always interesting to me, and I'll make this quick, that these groups um, want to sort of protect children and women from these horrible situations, and yet they have such a fundamental distrust of women as a group, right? If abortion is available on demand, women will become women will just become these sort of avid abortion, <laughs> you know, it's like, no, 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 yeah. no, you know, what kind of, what kind of morality do you think women have if you're not watching over them all the time? Well, you know? but that's part of a world. That's part of the yeah. problem, right? Eve, Is Eve, that, honestly, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, you find out that underneath all of those arguments, honestly, many people in those groups that are against this kind of yeah. progress really think that women at bottom are untrustworthy and potentially evil. End of story. End of you know? story, and for sure, if we grant equality, uh, as if you know, if we affirm that women do have this mm -hmm. equality, um, we are goes back to the collective unconscious, maybe, and the myths and the Pandora's box. We're letting Pandora open that box. We are, uh, you yeah. know, just bringing down the wrath of how many different theologies, gods on us. We are um, descended from a very misogynist culture, the Greeks. Yes, well that, yes, <laughs> Other mythologies have a different attitude about women, right? right? The Celts, for instance, with yes. the goddess Bridget, who is exactly. poetry and life and earth and war, and, you know, she's... There's I, other kinds yeah. of I, possibilities there for femininity. I think that's one thing. We looked around at my feminist books, and I showed you a bookcase that I said is the feminist spirituality collection, if you will. And it's not because I am doctrinal at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up as a Protestant in a socially conscious progressive denomination in Pennsylvania, but um, United Church of Christ, I'll name it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I feel that some of the roots of the cultural misogyny can't be dealt with without the dealing with the theology that it comes out of. And so that I find it interesting. I find it as an English major, I find all of the stories and those uh, dimensions of it wonderful and uh, obviously very three if not more dimensional in terms mm -hmm. of ex examining life um, so apart from I don't get into it in order to attack established organized religion 
but I do get into it to be able to counter the abuse of what the real messages of the mm. great religions are. Mm -hmm. And those have been so abused in so many ways yeah. um, that it, it, it's almost, pardon me, but it's so transparent as to how they've been abused. And let's just use, for example, teachings of Jesus uh, mm -hmm. have been so abused to be able to turn into some of the oppression of women that we see in the organized Christian religion yeah. that it's, you know, how can people defend it except that at, at some level that's so different from the rational level that you can't touch it. Mm. And that's, that's part of the frustration because not only can you not touch it in the um, theological realm, you can't get at it then in the Congress, let's say, the votes where people are voting on a bill around reproductive rights or pay equity. <laughs> Yesterday, the Republican uh, Senate caucus contingent um, made it impossible to pass a bill on pay equity on, on uh, Equal Pay Day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Help me with this. <laughs> but uh, there, there are some there are some things you just have to outlast. <laughs> I think yes. you know um, yes. that you just you just have to keep uh, a movement it. and a group of people alive long enough exactly. to hold on to that imagination of the future mm -hmm. to sort of outlast the. I mean, we're experiencing it. I think globally, just the last great. Um, this is not a kind term, but sort of the last great conniption fit of patriarchy. Well, I was thinking um, death throes. Just, I, yeah, I, just like, of death. I don't want to go. <laughs> that's right, that's and, right. it's, and, and what would you expect? Mm -hmm. I mean, any great energy, any great, um, I mean, let's face it, this is, this is a civilization that is 4,000 years old, right? Um, Four or five, yes. Yeah, that it's not going to let go easily. Why right. should it? You know, right. no energy in a person lets go easily. Um, That's another very good point. So. I, Jung had, I can't remember, I wish I could track down where I read it, but he said some problems are not going to be solved, they're going to be lived around. Yeah. And so I feel that that's, that's the approach I take with this, and we do hang on, and we have, I think, more and more energy going into living around this uh, oppression I think we really all do the time. Too. But it's... Again, not something that's going to happen in one generation, one century even. But uh, if it did happen so quickly, it would not have deep roots. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want it to look like it happened quickly because it could be overturned pretty quickly then too. Mm -hmm. I just why I did I picked it up I pick it up I don't know but I just reread The Handmaid's Tale oh, yeah. by Margaret <laughs> Atwood for anyone who would like uh, very interesting reading but. Uh, it's got a little bit of an upper at the end, <laughs> you know. It's like, oh my goodness! Okay, but it's very I'll dystopian. Tell you. Yes, it future. is dystopian. And um, when I, I think it was 1986 that that was published, and I thought, how did she? I mean, there were things going on that obviously were forerunners of some of what we're seeing now in the religious uh, rights influence in legislative bodies, both in the states and in Congress right now, but. Um, there are things in that book that are not that many leaps of imagination beyond what we're seeing in terms of the yes. repression that's going on now uh, politically. Yeah. So uh, anyone, I do like the term war on women and it's been used for decades. Mm -hmm. It's not something new that uh, you know it gets thrown around as oh, just a political a bit of jargon that's been thought up by the Democrats, no. No, no. No, yeah. It's, it's been around for a long term. time, and the war's been going on for a long time, and it's getting more virulent because maybe the tide is in the process of turning. I think so. I think so. I think the generation coming up behind mine, I'm about the same age as your daughter, uh -huh. um, uh, just it won't have any, generally, won't just won't have any patience for this. Yes. <laughs> They'll just be like, are yeah. you joking? Right. <laughs> well, that's yes. Are you kidding me? There's no way that this is how, you know... Um, I just hope they develop the political skills to pull that yeah. off. The political skills will be different from what I think of right now as political skills. Yeah. Obviously, the social media dimension is very uh, different from what we've had to work with, and it's very powerful. I And this is happening. I'm not saying this specific to my generation and, and theirs. Uh, it's with every succeeding generation going way back. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's important not to lose some of the old skills of how to play the game to make change happen mm. and 
and not think that just having uh, enough tweets get somewhere or uh, yeah you know I and I'm not saying that too negatively or critically but I do think that it's something but when I was in my 20s what political skills did I have uh, <laughs> you know well, so yeah. it's something that you learn as you're when Gen Growing X was into coming it. up, they were all like, these kids are totally, you know, when I was in my late teens and 20s, Generation mm -hmm. X, right? The slackers. Right, that's right. Like, these kids are totally disengaged. What kind of world are they going to govern? They don't know anything. They're that's not connected. Right. And I'm like, you know, and it's 20 years later, we're more conservative than anybody thought we were going to be. We're yes. infinitely more engaged than anybody thought yes. we were going to be. We are spending a gazillion hours with our children. <laughs> you know, yes. we're completely different than, than yes. the yes. dire predictions. And so... People grow up, they start to see the, the utility of these yeah. kinds of things. I think but. one thing to keep in mind, even though it's hard sometimes, and not too obviously applicable, but when my daughter has uh, two daughters who will be um, eight and five this summer. <laughs> and um, there they are. <laughs> um, <laughs> the future we're working yes, for. But one thing I said to Erica early on when Emma, the older one, was born, and Erica said it, really helped her much as it's just a little cliche kind of statement I said just remember you know when when you feel up to here just remember everything's a stage mm -hmm. the good as well as the bad so when the bad's the stage you say oh but don't worry I say it, it will change mm -hmm. but then you also have to remember the good will not stick around unless you work very hard to prolong its being there so it takes a lot of work but it does, it is a, again, to go back to life, <laughs> which I don't think of as a four-letter word, but sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. Yeah. Oh, life. Oh, yeah. life, I know. Well, that's, I mean, that's kind of a good opportunity to loop back again. Sure. Um, because, you know, you brought up the term the war on women and how that's actually a decades-old term. And often um, conservative pundits and politicians will say, well, there's no war on women. We like women. And, I, oh, right. and it's not that you're at war with us in any direct way. Um, it's that when you pass policies that don't let women collect Social Security or get paid equally or control their reproduction at every level, mm -hmm. um, you get women killed. <laughs> you know, when you don't support domestic violence programs, when you cut those back because your state is upside down in its budget, right. your women get killed, women die because of those decisions. And so when you're on this side of the mm -hmm. policy fence, it feels like it for certain. Absolutely. And, you know, just add to that and the And the women's health issue, I mean, you the know. decisions around reproductive rights, as if that's all about just stopping having a baby. Reproductive no, rights and women's health, <laughs> women's reproductive health. Are so much bigger than are you going to continue a pregnancy to term or not? Yes. And it's so treated only as will we give her the right to decide whether or not to continue a pregnancy to term? Right. Um, it's so, to me, it's so, um, well, indefensible. I said at the beginning, I'll just say whatever word comes to mind. No, mind. really. But it's it is <laughs> indefensible to, to do all that and then contend anything but. Uh, that you are making decisions that you know or have every reason to know are killing people. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, but politics always puts a different face on things that they don't want the real face to be showing of. Abstraction. <laughs> where, did that ten, where did that sentence go? But anyway. Abstraction can be a convenient thing. Yes. Right? This is about a principle. This That's is right. This is about a value. That's right. You know. Well, yeah, but people have yeah. to live inside of those principles and values, and yeah. some of them don't. Well, and those of so us I, working on these issues and day by day following, um, again, first thing came to mind, the Paul Ryan budget, or, mm -hmm. you know, following the policies that are detrimental to the point of killing, mm -hmm. murder, <laughs> let's call it. <laughs> if they want to call having a terminating a pregnancy in which the fetus is an encephalic, uh, yeah. murder, then let's call passing Knowingly the Paul starving. Ryan butter, budget murder. Knowingly taking food yes. away from children. And yeah. neither, neither one is the appropriate term. But right. <laughs> by fire with fire. Yeah. Um, yes, the food stamps. The, oh, again. That's another reason that, or another example of how every issue, when you're working on equal rights for women, and I'll epitomize that yeah. by the Equal Rights <laughs> Amendment, you can't ignore all these other issues that are connected with it, mm -hmm. up to and including if food stamps are cut. You're absolutely very differentially impacting women and children, 
you're causing some of them to have at the worst real health problem at the best real health problems at the worst perhaps not even survive mm -hmm. but um, that's I guess if I were in Congress, I'm, I'm laughing at myself, if I were in the House or the Senate and argued that way, I would be marginalizing myself so much in terms of the way you have to get things done in a venue like that, yeah. that I wouldn't have much of a following or be able to wield much leverage. So that's, that's part of the frustration too. The people we know in Congress are with us still sometimes don't stand up the way we would like to see them stand up, mm -hmm. but the President. Obama, President Obama, who, you know, his election obviously made a lot of us cry with joy, et cetera, mm -hmm. and yet we see ways in which um, we would wish he did some things very much more uh, energetically around some yeah. of these issues, yeah. some things that we wish he weren't doing, but that, you know, but, um, and yet I think I try hard not to be unfair and expect that everybody in the highest political places where decisions are made and votes are cast, to expect every one of them to be saying what we have the luxury of being able to say outside needing to work within that system. Yeah. And I think that's the only realistic way. I mean, you know, there are people who get very disillusioned, oh, we thought Obama was going to be different. Mm -hmm. You know, give me him over virtually anybody else I could imagine. For real. That but would have he been inherits. An alternative. And you know, yes. he inherits you know, a military industrial complex. He inherits a certain kind That's of right. economy. He inherits a certain kind of culture. Mm -hmm. And as much as we imagine that all of those people in power in that little town are <laughs> free agents, you know, they're not any more oh. free than anybody else. They're embedded in West in some ways, relation less and debt. Free because yeah. of the awful campaign system, financing and so oh, on that we have set up. Yeah. And they're, they have to be the... Uh, I have handmaids in my mind, yeah. the handmaidens of <laughs> corporations yeah. and so on. Or I, I say have to be, but they must take into account that that's some of the butter that goes on their bread. Well, it wouldn't it wouldn't hurt people to occasionally rewatch The Candidate with Robert Redford. Oh, right? that's a good idea. Yes. <laughs> you know, absolutely. Because there's there's your idealist who yeah. who just gets beaten into a different shape. That's it, right? That's it. Yeah. So, and I don't say that um, completely hopelessly. No. Because there are always the good, you know, the, the ones who do say There's stand Elizabeth up. Warren. Oh, for sure, right you know, now. Elizabeth Warren She's is, a black swan in a way, right? I mean, yeah. where did that, how did that? That's happen? right. <laughs> <laughs> but the more people like that uh, who do make a place for them in that, mm -hmm. let's call it congressional uh, mm -hmm. pond, <laughs> Reach back um, the up. more who do that and don't get drowned, yeah. the better off yeah. we all are. Well, I think if, if women like that, you know, reach out to each other and yeah. to their male colleagues and pull people along with them, yeah. you know. I think that you're just making me think of another thing I need to put in here just about myself, which is that, because that made me think of the fact that I've worked on a couple of consultant projects with the Center for American Women in Politics, which is at Rutgers University at Eagleton Institute of Politics. Um, Fabulous! It's a national resource on statistics for women's uh, progress in political office at various levels. Uh, also, they have done programs. This twice at least I worked on the staff, and and once uh, was a, moderated a workshop. Every four years, they used to do a forum for women state legislators from all around the country, out at Hotel Del Coronado in California, which mm -hmm. is not bad duty, mm -hmm. and. Um, they would bring together all the women in state legislatures from around the country, and it was a fabulous, fabulous both networking opportunity and opportunity to, and they always did it the November before the presidential election and invited the, at that time, the chief presidential candidates to speak. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so there, I learned there, you know, to my core, how important it is to have women in political office. Um, how, again, while the women, when they get there, have all the three-dimensional, having to look around and make sure they remain effective and don't marginalize themselves, um, that if you have people there with the right kind of uh, policies and consciousness, an awful lot of your lobbying work is already done because those people will 
cast votes the way you would want them to. Mm -hmm. So that's critically important. And around the Equal Rights Amendment, just to go back to the 